Well, hello and welcome everyone to a new episode of Tawheed, the Spiritual Unity of the Three Principles. Uh, it's, it's been a while actually, and uh, I'm really excited for this episode uh, because we have a really special guest with us, uh, Jacqueline Hollow or Mama J. And the topic today is how to take inspired action, something that uh, I don't think we've touched upon in this uh, Facebook group. And, and, you know, we've always been talking about this understanding, but I think we are not going anywhere from that. We are just going even deeper because uh, taking inspired action is really about uh, getting in touch with that spirit with, within us to see clearly what, what we should do next. And so um, I'm sure most of you know who, uh, Jacqueline Hollow is, but for those who doesn't know, I don't want to go through the bio. I just want to share what uh, um, you know. I think about you, what I feel about you, and uh, I'm I'm really inspired actually. And I know you've been doing a lot of work in in the UK uh, prison system. Uh, Jacqueline was sharing this uh, uh, with Beyond Recovery. Uh, it's a non-profit uh, organization, and uh, Jacqueline is also. Um, a mentor and well-being coach. Uh, so she's sharing this all over the place with everyone and with uh, entre entrepreneurs and, and uh, you know, uh, change workers. Uh, and um, yeah, I, I know that you recently published a book, uh, Wing of an Angel. So, so excited to have uh, at least, uh, you know, uh, in, in my candle so I could read it. But I'm yeah. really excited to receive my copy here in Morocco. So good to have you with us, Jacqueline. Thank you so much. Lovely to be with you. And I was so frantic when I come on here because I had tech issues and I didn't have any drink next to me. And I was so frantic. And your beautiful presence and your beautiful audience have made me really feel calm down. I'm so glad that uh, uh, you feel this way, Jacqueline. So... How to take inspired action, right? Um, so, so I was, you know, asking you, uh, when I, you know, when I invite you to come on and and you know share something with us, and and I asked you, what would you like to share on? And you said, how to take inspired action. And that was, um, you know, kind of uh, something fresh and new for me because um, I know we've never done this here on Tawhid, and it's something that is really, you know, needed to to be. Uh, uh, spoken about, you know, uh, really knowing how to take that inspired action in whatever, whatever that is. And I think it's not really about just, you know, someone's career or I think taking inspired action is in everything, in our relationships, in um, with people outside, uh, you know, how we are in this world. It's actually a way of of being, really, and so I'm I'm looking forward to hear, um, you know, what you have to share on that. So over to you, Jacqueline. Oh, thank you. So I'll share, and I am really happy for questions and thoughts and comments and anything that people want to say. Uh, please just jump in and ask or share. You know, we're not we're not the uh, the sages on the stage. Me and Omar, we're we're just here as as guides, but all of us have the wisdom. So if anything comes up for you that you'd like to share, then other people may need to hear that. So feel free to share that. So I, I'm really grateful to have this opportunity to talk about this subject. Charlotte, the lovely Charlotte was in a, a seminar with me in, in Copenhagen recently where we touched on this subject. And it occurred to me, it, it, in my journey over the last 13 years, I've worked with people in prison, I've worked with professionals, I've trained many, many people, many facilitators, and I've been on many training courses. And what I've noticed about deeply heartfelt um, spiritual uh, workers, change makers, we can we can either go one way or the other. We can either like lean into intuition or wisdom and not do anything because we're waiting for it. Um, 
or we can be a little bit like me because I'm a I'm a sort of multi-passionate person so I always have lots of things on the go and so we can we can be in action all the time and be in the doing and what I, I during the course of um the amazing work with beyond recovery and the amazing people that I met I actually had a breakdown in um I think it was 2018 and I I literally had a um a whole mental breakdown and I'd been teaching the principles for uh three years or four years at that point so you think I know better right and 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 there I was um I'd actually been on a retreat uh with a person called Alcy Spittle I should have been in this whole zen-like place and uh I came back from this retreat and because I'd been so like And this story is in my book, by the way, a little plug for the book. Um, and I was full on, I was full on working in prison, um, having meetings, getting my emails done, da, 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 busy, busy. And it got to the Friday of that week and I was at a, a meeting in London and I came out of this meeting in London and I literally collapsed in tears outside of the meeting. And I my my mind went completely to mush i didn't know what to do i didn't know how to get home i didn't know what was wrong with me i just i i, I just collapsed really and i and i called my husband and he said just get to the tube and get yourself home so i i managed to do that it was an effort and uh, i did it and over the next couple of weeks, I was in this um, deep state of something, breakdown, depression, whatever it was. I had lots of loving advice from many people, um, you know, contact Dickie Bettinger or get get HRT because I'm a little bit older. Um, you know, these all these things like go to the doctors, do this, do that. And I knew one thing, and the one thing was, I'll know what I need. I'll be guided. Now, it, it didn't make me feel any better. You know, I was still in a real funk, and I actually believed I was going to feel like this forever and that I would never be able to work. I had to cancel everything in my diary, and I'd never be able to work again. But I, but I knew without a doubt that I would be guided. And the guiding that came to me was really simple stuff. It was get some sleep, um, you know, binge on Netflix, uh, eat, go outside, sit in the garden, uh, drink water. It, it was really simple. It, there was no life shattering insights at all. But I followed that guidance. So I just slept most of the time, cried most of the time. And sometimes there would be a, a nudge, like go outside and sit in the garden. And I'd go outside and sit in the garden. And, and then it might occur to me to do a bit of deadheading of the flowers or, um, or I mean, I didn't really go for a walk or anything, but just the next thing would occur to me. And then when it wasn't occurring to me, I, I slept. <laughs> and I got over that state within two weeks, which I'm told is very unusual to have such a complete breakdown like that. It was very unusual. I realized, of course, that I'd overworked, but I couldn't really make sense of it. And at the end of the two weeks, I... I had this I mean it, it lasted much longer but I started to function again at the end of the two weeks and at the end of the two weeks I had this thought I'm going to see something really big you're going to see something really big I, ha I had and there was a tiny moment and it was on Sunday morning I was in bed I could I could see the fields from my bedroom window 
I could see the trees and I could hear the birds singing. And I'd, I'd got a cup of tea, uh, lemon and ginger tea by my side. And I was holding onto that and smelling the beautiful smells of lemon and ginger. And I, I suddenly knew without a doubt that everything is part of consciousness. And in, it was, it was a, like a second. And in, in the second, I could feel the bird wings and I could, I felt like I was the air and it felt like I was the clouds. Like I could just feel all of this expansiveness. And I knew it were all, everything, everything is, is just consciousness. And then it looks like fall. Um, and then gradually over the next few weeks, I, I recovered and I learned a couple of things. And, and so I'm going to fast forward in a minute, but I'll just in that moment, I learned um, I'm a person with um, a, a lived experience of trauma and addiction and um, all sorts of things in my background. And my coping mechanism was always to push through. Um, so keep on going, pushing through. And that's what I'd been doing. So I realized that. And then I also realized that I'd got a sensitivity to when I'm pushing through now that I never had before. So before I would get overwhelmed, but I would still keep going or I'd be overworked and I would still keep going. And I realized that the, the breakdown gave me this gift of a sensitivity to that. And, and I'll use this analogy because it, it's how I felt at the time. I used to be a drinker and I was always the last person drinking at, at the bar, you know, that, that I was proud of the fact that I never, ever, I was always the last person. I could push through anything. I can, I could barely remember what happened, but I was still standing. And I realized that I was doing the same with work. I was pushing through and pushing through and pushing through. So I got some very useful insights and, and, and I was very grateful to have gone down into that mush because I, I had more empathy and more understanding for people who, who have uh, these types of experiences, right? So, I mean, life gives you gifts, right? So fast forward to where we are now, um, I've never experienced that again. Equally, I'm more aware when I'm getting into overwhelm or when I'm get when I'm going too hard at something, and I'm more aware of the state of rest that I I I need to to rest, um, and and take a step back from time to time. And I have this habit of getting into stuff, and and then I need to step away and breathe and and so on. Uh, and what came up about inspired action was that, is all this making sense? Okay. Was that there is a, there is a magical middle ground between getting inspired and, and getting productive productive and it's this inspired action so if we call it intuition or wisdom whatever you want to call it intuition tells you all the time what to do and when to do it all the time like every single moment of every single day uh, that wisdom within us that inner guide within us informs us what we need to do next and more often than not, if you're anything like me, <laughs> you ignore it. <laughs> and and sometimes you follow it or sometimes you go, oh, yeah, I'll do that. But we ignore the simplicity of wisdom. Now, wisdom, we can have, you know, profound moments like that moment of consciousness. We can have these profound moments. But in in my experience and in, in the experience of the many people that I've worked with, they're 
they're few and far between. They're not, they're not all the time. And you can't make them happen. But what is all the time is this gentle, loving guidance that takes us from A to B, that that says what's about what what to do now. And and we then need to act on it. So what I found in in spiritual communities in general is that we're all waiting for that that you know sort of lightning strike of wisdom to tell us what to do and we're ignoring the tiny little nudges that will lead us to what to do uh, and if i may i'll tell one more quick story that emphasizes that so omar mentioned that i founded an organization called beyond recovery so that organization took the understanding of the three principles into prisons. And we've worked with over 400 uh, people in prison. And um, when, when I first changed my career, I used to be in IT and customer services. And when I first changed my career in 2013 to be a life coach, I'd learned about the three principles and all of these other mo modalities. And I was very busy with myself trying to be a life coach. <laughs> and uh, I maybe had one, one client a month or something, but you know, I thought I was a life coach and, and that's what I needed to do. And along that journey, I met uh, the most inspiring person I've ever met, who was three years in recovery from um, heroin addiction. He'd been in and out of prison the whole of his life. And it was, it was, it just blew me away. He was so inspiring that I just offered to volunteer for his company, um, which he used to uh, teach people to create film and write scripts and uh, do anything to do with uh, media. And so I volunteered for him, helping him in his company. And he uh, had never been educated, but he was at college. And he was going to university and he needed a support worker because he had some disabilities that he needed he needed help with. Uh, and it was a paid role. And he offered me the job. And um, I said, oh, no, I'm a life coach. <laughs> um no thank you and it was like 25 pounds an hour or something and I in those days I I was like I can earn 75 pounds an hour regardless of the fact that I had no clients right or one client a month and he kept offering it to me and eventually he said if you're not if you're really not interested I'll, I'll get someone from an agency at that time I was flat broke um, I'd had my car repossessed. I um I I often would think, do I put do I um you know, do I use this last fiver to buy food or <laughs> or pay for electricity? I mean, I was honestly I was going through a really tough time. And yet I kept ignoring this offer for work and just very, very luckily. On the on the when he said I'm going to go to an agency, suddenly hit me. Uh, he ask him how many hours he wants, and he wanted something like twenty hours a week. So this is twenty five pounds at twenty hours a week. It was like a fortune to me. <laughs> and I thought, why am I saying no? What's wrong with me? So, you know, you see what I mean? The nudges, it kept occurring, kept occurring. But I kept thinking, not that. I'm going to be this amazing life coach and work in Hawaii and, um, or Morocco. And, um, uh, you know, have all, these, have all these, these people flock to me. So I said yes to the job. Uh, I didn't love the job. I absolutely didn't love it. I did a good job. He got a first class honours degree in media and communications um but it and it was a bit of a grind but I learned a lot and I did it but here's the magic he used to do home detoxes which means that addicts would come to his home the local nurse would come in and do the meds part and then he would look after the people while they went through their difficulties their tremors and and all of that and 
you know, I'd be there a lot of the time because I was working for him. So we'd cook meals and we'd have chats and we'd make cups of tea. And I uh, met hundreds of people with addictions and who'd been in prison and, uh, you know, all of this sort of thing. And I loved them. I loved them so much. They were so resilient and determined and creative and loving. And I absolutely loved speaking to them. And I talked to them accidentally about the inside out nature of life and they'd get insights. So two things, one is I always say that they taught me about the three principles because they were living, breathing proof that the way we feel about life is from the inside out because I could see that when they were in their heads, they were really struggling. And when they weren't in their heads, they were getting on with it. And the second thing was, if I hadn't done that work and met those people, I'd have never started Beyond Recovery. And Beyond Recovery that went on until COVID, and we worked with 400 people and we've got four research papers and I wrote a book out of it and, you know, had a personal transformation as well as the transformations that I've seen wouldn't have happened if I hadn't have taken that leap of faith and, and taken a job I didn't really want. See what I mean? Like the signs are always there, but they don't always look the way we think they should. So inspired action is about trusting that wisdom is going to feed you and then taking action on those things and not worrying about what we our story of what we think it should look like i'll pause for questions that's beautiful wow that's really beautiful you know um you know when you shared the uh, about uh you know listening to wisdom uh, and it's always speaking to us it, it reminded me when i started you know tawhid mentoring academy because i've always been scared to take this uh take this step and open a business it was always big in my head you know it's for the big guys it's for you know people who you know i was just ma magnifying it in my head for some reason and um, I still remember the day it, it really, it, it, it hit me and it changed. And opening business kind of came effortless after that. Um, I was listening to Sidney Banks and he said something along these lines. Uh, he said, um, anyone here sitting in this room might be way ahead of us, including myself. And that really hit me because like, I really saw that I was uh, kind of um, something else that Sydney Banks said, uh, never, never put yourself down. There is no one who has done any better or any worse than you. And um, it, it kind of um, took this BS out of my mind. And all I was left is, you know, uh, taking this inspired action mm. you know so that to me like when you mentioned inspired action that's what i've um I, I was reminded of you know and and i and there are many many examples that i could you know share uh that were taken from that space so i really loved what you shared uh jacqueline here and um yeah let's op let's open it up for questions and um uh, anyone that. who wants to share something that's a great example there, Omar. Yeah, it's absolutely perfect. Thank you. So does anyone has a question for Mama J? A question or something you want to share? You know, as she said, we are not the experts here. We're just, uh, you know, exploring this together. And and often, you know, um, I really see that when we are 
in a room together like this. You you channel or you you bring such a bigger energy into the room that's beyond us. And I say that because if there is something on your mind, some question or something that you want to say, it's your duty really to say it because it's not for you. It's to help somebody else who's listening because we get self-conscious, don't we, about our questions. But actually, whatever question it is that you, you know, that whole thing, there's no stupid questions. Well, that never really made any sense to me. But then I realized that when we just say what comes onto our minds is actually somebody else, maybe not even on this in this Zoom room, maybe on Facebook or maybe who's watching the replay that goes, oh, I'm so glad they asked that. So please be, yes, uninhibited. Randy is, is ready. Yes. Hello. <laughs> Thank you for your inspiring um um uh, stories i don't know how to put on my camera um so i hope it's okay that i'm i'm incognito uh oh there thank you for <laughs> um i was thinking uh, you spoke a lot about uh, people with uh, different kind of i guess abuses when you are uh, working with criminals and i think uh, a lot of people also not criminal people would think well i'm very much inspired to eat for instance, unhealthy food. Uh, I would like the next cake. I've just eaten a cake watching you. And I thought about, hmm, maybe maybe it wasn't so good if I followed my intuition and thought, well, I should maybe eat more. I don't have a problem. But I was thinking a lot of people have problem with uh, overeating and a lot of other stuffs um, where you should learn to control that impulse of wanting to follow your intuition. Um how would you um how would you what would you say to that? How how to deal with that? I mean. <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that intuition tells us to overeat. <laughs> I think I think you used the right word there about impulse. So we might have an mm -hmm. impulse which is different from intuition or wisdom. Uh, um, so and this is how we can tell the difference before I answer the question. We can we can tell the difference because wisdom is very simple and very clear. It comes without a bunch of shoulds and thoughts and, and expectations. So as you just said in, in your question, um, oh, maybe I should do this or maybe I shouldn't do that, right? As soon as that's there, we can know that's our red flag to go, oh, this isn't intuition. Now, I'm not saying that means don't do it. It's just a little flag that says, oh, that's I see where that's coming from. That's coming from there. I still eat cake. <laughs> so, you know, I feel you. <laughs> but yeah. it it's intuition or wisdom is way more soft and clear. So... um. I'm working with, with a friend of mine and uh, she talks about really wanting insight about her eating. And what I've been trying to help her with is showing her that she's getting insight all day long. She mm -hmm. just doesn't, she doesn't hear it because it's soft and gentle. And so she started to talk about things like, oh yeah, I'm noticing that when I had fish and chips, I didn't eat all the chips and I'm noticing that um, when there was cake on offer, I, I didn't want it now. I'm not saying that I won't have it later. That's, that's wisdom. Wisdom. That's her going, okay, um, I'm not going to, I'm not going to eat that cake right now. I might eat it later, but I'm not going to eat it right now. When you're a person with any sort of disordered thinking, on food alcohol sex gambling whatever it is we get a lot of disordered thinking especially if there is some stuff in our backgrounds but also just from what we've picked up in life what our parents did what we saw here and there we just pick all of that up don't we but we don't really notice that it's disordered 
we just noticed the noise. So I used to get on the scales and sometimes go, huh, I'm just not getting on the scales for another, you know, <laughs> I'm not looking at that number again. Or I'd get on the scales and go, oh my gosh, I need to go on a diet. And I would swing from being on a crazy diet to, to doing nothing and eating a lot of cake. And what I realized is, oh, I, uh, about 18 months ago, I realized I have a lot of disordered thinking. They come, you know, come from all my life and come from when, you know, when I was three years old. But I, I need to go on a diet of, from dieting is what I thought. And, and the second thought was little things make a big difference. So they're just little things occurred to me to, to, you know, not eat a biscuit in bed at night, for instance, or maybe enjoy fasting for 12 hours. But I didn't put myself on a diet. I just listened to, to the nudges and then started hearing when it was disordered. So whenever, whenever it says, you know, eat all of the biscuits, um, which it does, um i'm i'm not saying that i do or don't do that the action the action is the action but i start to recognize oh that's the noise the intuition is quiet and it's always always going to be supportive it's never going to be hurtful to you it's never going to say i'm going to say something that might trigger people now so just a quick warning it's never going to say harm yourself. It's never going to say end your life. Now, when it does, when it does do those things, and I've experienced that myself, it's the best it can give you in that moment. But all that's telling you is, like if with the overeating, it's the same. All that's telling you is you're really tired and your state of mind is low. It could be tired of life, could be tired of a situation. So just take, oh, I'm getting that thought. Hang on a minute. I, I, I need to rest and see what's beneath that. Does that answer your question, Randy? Yes, it does. It also makes me curious about all things. But but yes, I, I think what I understand is that, uh, uh, that being... Uh, you, when your body tells you, to, I don't know if it's the right word, to do something healthy, that is good for you. Um, I know that three cakes might seem very healthy at a bad time, but but um, I don't know if you can compare it with it. It would always try to um, to lift you up to to a more healthy level than than your need for something uh, for your what did you call that uh, kind of thoughts um this behavior or, or that i know i'm not being clear i'm sorry but i think i know I, what I you mean something. yeah i heard something in what you said so it, it, if you if you think your body's telling you to eat three cake if my, if i think if it occurs to me to eat three cakes which it has and which i've done so just you know no <laughs> shame here um <laughs> thank you <laughs> if it tells me to eat three cakes if i'm aware of enough of where i'm at that's to me a little red flag of or oh, something's going on here that i need to take care of myself yeah because we know three cakes is not good for us right but it's mm -hmm. not about that it's not about that we've all done that i i suspect it's about being able to see oh, hang on a second, why is that craving coming to me? Something something else is going on for me. And, and mm. if we wait and don't, don't judge those thoughts, don't argue with them, if we wait often, more wisdom will come, which mm. could say you're, you're tired or you're feeling lonely or, you know, whatever it is. And, and so the, the next <laughs> train comes along with a, you know, mm. A, a bit more a bit more helpful advice but because we we tend to be impulsive we go off of the first thing or oh, eat three cakes yes i'm going to eat three cakes and i i ate five cakes one time because i bought a pack of donuts 
And I sat in the car and I ate one of the, I love jam donuts. So if I come and visit you, don't forget that. And so I sat in the car and I ate one of the jam donuts. It was so tasty. It was delicious. I wanted another one. So then I, ate, and I mean, I mean, when I say one time, like not that long ago, <laughs> anyway, so I, I ate another one. So now I've got a pack of donuts with two donuts missing. I couldn't take that. My disordered thinking was <laughs> I can't go home and my husband will see I ate two. I'm going to have to eat them all. Not through the rest of my Delete, life. delete. <laughs> yes. I'm going to. And I ate them all. And I, I by the fifth one, I felt sick. And it, it, the taste of the jam and the sweetness, I was going, oh, this is horrible. I'm going to be sick in a minute. And it tasted disgusting, but I still ate it. Because my disordered thinking was, well, you can't, you can't admit that you've ate two donuts. So then I went and ate five, right? Now, if you... <laughs> so don't follow me, whatever you do. So, what I know is, and, and to be fair, I've never done that since because I can see that is completely crazy. But I had my crazy moment. And to be fair, what I realised was afterwards, wow, I've got a whole load of thinking about mm. being judged about my eating. Mm. Yeah. And... And probably on myself more than anyone else because my husband's not judgmental. Mm. I've got a whole load of thinking there. And that's what alerted me to maybe maybe you need to clean some of this up. Maybe you need some help yeah. with this and you can't do it on your own. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Emma, did you want to jump in? Uh, thank you, Randy. Uh, Randy uh, something that came up to me uh, when she was uh, asking the question is that um, um, most of the time when we feel low, if not uh, all the time when we feel low, we look for something in the world of form to fix the way we feel. And so uh, eating, uh, uh, eating disorder is one of them. Or an addiction like uh, get addicted to alcohol or sex or whatever that is, or addicted to one thought about something or someone. And that's um, that's a signal for us to, you know, uh, as um, uh, Mama Jay said, to to really calm down, slow down. Um, mm -hmm. That we are not heading in the right direction. So this is not something uh, bad. Uh, telling us something bad about us that that's not true because like you will hear many things like uh, you will be self-judging yourself and and criticizing yourself with yourself you know nobody is criticizing you and and that really brings us lower and lower and lower and we're gonna maybe eat more to try to deal with that so it's not really helping um i think uh, the, the the thing is to really um to to not buy into that uh i heard sydney banks once once saying um i i i'm not interested in your problems mm. so don't be interested in your problems because mm. they are not really real they are maybe they feel real in that moment but they are not really telling you about yourself or the word or anything like that they are just telling you that you're sidetracking your thinking and that's all and you don't need to do anything about that to fix that really that that's actually it's really interesting because when we do feel this way it's always we have to do something about it mm -hmm. but but it's it's really the opposite it's really the opposite mm -hmm. well thank you randy that's a, that was a beautiful question and thank you jacqueline for answering it beautifully um so anyone else christina yeah, yeah. hi mm, hi <laughs> when i look uh, at my life i think um when i was younger i was really unintentional unintentionally and when i look back at it good at doing the i succeeded unconsciously in doing the in 
intentional what what do you call it uh, Jacqueline intuitive no this you have a you have a feeling you do it and it uh, something comes out uh, wonderfully but when I 20 years uh, ago when I became 27 years ago when I became a mother things shifted somehow because now I wasn't only responsible for myself I had the responsibility for for three kids as well and instead of leaning into intuition and wisdom I started to lean on form and society's expectations because somehow it was um, a bigger um, responsibility being responsible for other beings which intuition I could not feel and well now they are they they are almost grown up so I can start lean back again but <laughs> it's a crazy it's when I look at it retrospectively I can see that something happened when I suddenly was responsible for beings that wasn't just myself I yeah. it it was less playful somehow yeah exactly exactly so all the clues are in in your your comment which is beautiful that suddenly you had more thought about how it should be so instead of leaning into wisdom you you <laughs> it's a bit like i sometimes think well you know mind hasn't got this so i need to i need to get on with it you know <laughs> And I trust myself more than I trust the universal mind, right? Um, mm. And it's a bit like that. It's that suddenly we have all these thoughts about expectations and, and what it should be like, and we've got responsibility. And as you mentioned, the playfulness. So when the playfulness goes away, we get heavier thought. And when we get heavier thought, we don't look so much at the, at the you know, the, the massive universe that can provide <laughs> the answers. Mm look at our tiny little mind mm. and the walls of form so it's a perfectly natural thing that happened to you it's 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 um it's not necessarily it has to happen but it happened but it did happen to you so it it looks like um let's say i have a little grandson and he's just over one now and um he was born with uh, a little disfigurement, so he doesn't have half of his left arm. And um, I haven't been left on my own with him yet. But sometimes if I think about being left on my own with him, I sort of get a little bit panicky thinking, how will I take care of him? Um, what about this? What about that? And I can see that I take myself out of leaning into intuition and into trying to be a good Mimi they call me um whereas with my little granddaughter I'm just completely natural with her and mm. uh just a just completely the Mimi you know within the restrictions that we have just the Mimi that I am and so I see that oh thinking takes me away from um being able to really really be the best Mimi I can be because I think I've got it and I'm not going to be guided, but of course I'm going to be guided with him. Why would it be any different? Hmm. So I don't know if you you had a question, but what I really heard is how loving you are, how beautifully loving you are to have brought up your children and, and accept that you did your very best and you haven't lost the ability no. to to be playful mm -hmm. at no. all you can lean back into that now. but I think one of the reasons that I mention also is that I am doing a coaching education at the time and I notice that every time clients or conversation partners or whatever you want to call them rises a question according to <laughs> parenting it's like <laughs> it's I fall into this. Oh, I know this. It's really difficult. So I kind of get to take their problem serious. And then, I mean, I can't really coach them. <laughs> yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah. Life gives us lessons. 
So that's that's what it's doing. It's showing you on the areas that you need to grow in. Whenever we go into our habit or our um, uh, I work with a homeless charity. So I was working with some homeless people today or home insecure people. And I was working with a girl and I know her background and she's got a very, very difficult background. And we were doing deep listening and she was telling me uh, about this problem with her health and she was talking about it. And I kept having all these ideas for her, <laughs> like, have you checked the nurse? And, you know, can you do this and this and this? And all this fixing came into my mind and also came into my mind. Um, uh, oh, she she really spirals herself with this negative thinking. And then I caught myself because I was in a deep listening exercise, so I wasn't allowed to speak, thank goodness. Um, I caught myself and I thought, what do you know? I I only know what I know like that's nothing compared to what consciousness knows so I just settled down and at as I started listening from there she just started talking about some other really positive experience that she'd had and she got all excited and animated so when I when I stepped out of trying to fix and trying to know she changed without me saying anything. I just listened and she changed because the depth of my listening increased and she must have been able to feel that. Mm. So then she's yeah. responding with, with where her mind goes. Mm. So when you're with those clients, they're the ones where you need to listen more and 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 look beyond your own assumptions yeah that's true thank you thank you that's beautiful and and that's a really good uh a question you brought up christina and um i just want to say this uh really quickly that uh when, when uh th this happens a lot you know with us you know coaches when we have a client and we try to especially if there's something that we could relate to and we are experiencing in that moment uh, but but something is much deeper than that is that uh, when you are in front of a, trying to help someone, it's not really about you anymore. It's not about us. And I think uh, trying to make us track it, trying to make it about us is really coming in the way to have a really impactful uh, coaching session where you know deep listening and connection and presence happens naturally. Um, anything that comes in the way, really, these are just, um, you know, that noise in the background. So you you truly could help anyone, you know, like who who have this experience with their kids, you know, about parenting. Um, I mean, I've um, I've had a client who, well, I've had many clients who ask me, how can I, you know, like uh, I have this kid and he's making me crazy and he's doing this and that. How can I? Can you talk with him? And I said, listen, can we have a conversation together first? And then I'll have a conversation with your kid. And it turns out that I never have a conversation with their kids. They just start seeing them differently. You know? Um, it, so it, it, it's really... It's it's really beautiful when we see that, you know, this this work is not truly about us. Like we don't... We cannot really take credit for what happens in this session because once we do we really lose it we lose the essence where this really happened from oh wow the time flies by quickly um i'm not too sure how, how long uh you, you uh, made yourself available for us today mama J, but i'm happy to go for another 10, 15, 20 minutes, up to you. Oh, yeah, that's all good. Yeah, I'm delighted okay. to. Great. So uh, who's next? You know, it feels like when I say who's next, people hear like, who is next? <laughs> 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 It's scary. <laughs>
But who's next? Oh, Maya. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I um, I felt scared, so I thought that's for me. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. Yeah. Thank you so much for all your sharings. I'm not really sure if I have a question, but um, this. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I I just enjoy um listening to this and um um just noticing that when when this scary part shows up, it's not really scary. It's just about like noticing it and and then being in, in that <laughs> that I don't know. Hmm. Yeah. That's beautiful. So thank you. So I can tell you a little story about that if you'd like it. Sure. So when... I mean, who doesn't love stories here? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> when I um when I started working in prison, I one of the decisions was that I became a key holder. So I had to be trained to collect the keys and be responsible for the keys and open all the gates. And there are hundreds of gates. And because of that, I had some very intensive training. So the, it took around about six months to get all the training, the security training and the key training and the all sorts of things. I can't even remember them all now. And in the training, they scare you to death. Like it's all about fear. It's all about watching out for the people who are trying to manipulate you and watching out for the weapons and watching out for the people that have hurt themselves and making sure that you don't get taken hostage and you know it's a vet it, it's all about scare being scared and on my first day in prison apologies to the people who've heard this already on my first day in prison my, I had my little my little beyond recovery t-shirt on and my little clipboard with all the names on it for the people who are going to be in my class and there had been a, an incident in the prison. And so the men had been locked up longer than usual. Um, not now because they're locked up a long time now, but for those days. And so they were all a little bit agitated and they were banging the cells with their plastic cups. And there was all this noise. It was, it was horrendous. And I literally thought, it's like the TV. You know, it's just like really scary, like the TV. And then men came out of their cells and they were half naked and jumping over the railings and there's all this noise. And I was petrified and I wanted to be there. And yet I was so scared. And I did think, what on earth am I doing here? <laughs> and I was standing there with my clipboard and this man came up to me and he was he looked like a prisoner to me, you know, in them days. And he was he was big and he had shaved head and he had tattoos on his neck and he was a bit scary. And he and he said, um, hello, miss. Um, I want to see the chicks. And chicks in English is slang for women. And so and the rule is if they're not on the list, you're not allowed to let them in. So I said, oh, what's your name? And he told me his name. And I looked on my list and he wasn't on the list, thank goodness. And and, and I thought, oh, he's not on the list. <laughs> and, uh, and I looked at him and he was staring at me. And I said, OK, then. <laughs> Even though I wasn't supposed to. And he came into the room and the room was on the wing where all the men live. And he came into the room and moved my flip chart away from the window and all the officers line up outside so that the men don't escape. And uh, I thought he wanted to stare out the window at the female officers. So he moved the 
which are out of the way. And uh, the, the windows are very small, almost like our little Zoom screens with bars. And then what you can see is um, a big, big barbed wire fence with all barbed wire on top. And then past that, you can you can see what they call the parade ground. So I was just behind him while he was looking out the window. And on the window ledge was a nest with little eggs, dove eggs in the nest. And those were the chicks that he wanted to see. He wanted to see had the chicks hatched from the eggs yet. Nothing to do with what I thought. And I saw the invisible judgment had created my fear. And I saw that it didn't, it didn't serve me. It was just invisible judgment about the very people that I wanted to work with. And I always say to people that he saved our program because without him, he humbled me. I realized how beautiful and warm and loving these people are. And I was standing there in fear. My fear story. What did you hear in that, Maya? Yeah, I um yeah I loved it, and I I um yeah, just Im imagined the um the experience of being in that place, and you know a lot of things could scare me, like that 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 would be absolutely innocent. Um and um yeah so um when when I get past that point you know it's just it's okay <laughs> yeah 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 beautiful mm. yeah thank you so like, much well, like my kids could scare me when when they cannot wake up at the exact time that I decided they should wake up, why is that scary? Mm. And yeah. they, they could scare me if they don't get to school at right on time. Why is that scary? Right? Yeah. <laughs> so I've been experimenting with that sort of fear of failure, you could say, on behalf of my kids. Mm. And um, yeah, so it's just good to know that everyone survived, even though they don't come at the like before it rains. So, <laughs> and you know, even if they don't graduate from anywhere, they will be okay people too. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's beautiful. Well, that was a beautiful story. Thank you, Maya, and thank you, Jacqueline, for this beautiful story. Hmm. Anyone else? Nina. Hi. Hello, good to see you. Thank you, the same. Nice to be in this beautiful room. Uh, I don't know if this is a question or what it is, but um, I like to say something. Um, I have always, I think, been a bit afraid of taking action. Uh, it has, that expression has meant in my head to be something very, very big. And for me, it has felt more safe to stay calm, not to do anything. Only do what I usually do, uh, not do anything new, stay in the safe habits, and don't um, 
don't complete don't change don't uh, say against something that happens you just follow what happens kind of I've been afraid of, of protesting or doing something different take a, a step out or just follow it, for me it's a kind of feeling of being pass passive is that an English word passive yeah stay passive that's been the safe feeling for me but what I have experienced after being more connected to what is bigger than me when I felt that the um, mind is living me I, I, I'm being lived I don't have the responsibility to to take the actions on my own, I will be guided. When I've been connected to this, I suddenly observe myself, suddenly do something that I usually don't do, and I'm not afraid of it. But so far, it's a, it's a small thing. I can tell you that um, I've had a lot of pain uh, because of my health, and very often I can wake up during the night and I have pain and I, I have been, my habits had been to just lie very quiet, just wait and, and it will pass. And I haven't dared to do anything. The, the, to take some action has seemed, no, that's, I'm not allowed to do that. I just have to be passive and go through it. But now during the nights, I find myself, self, suddenly I'm up in the bathroom, I am having some water. Or I go down in the living room and I just go around and enjoy to be to be more um, active. And I haven't been thinking of how to take an action. It's just suddenly happening. So I feel the actions are coming there for me. And now for um, one or two years ago, I wouldn't have dared to speak in such a room in English, which is not my language. And I would just feel, I want to do it. And when uh, Mama J, is that what you call her? <laughs> Mama J? Yeah. When you said that, that these actions, they come with, they are simple and they come without a story. I can, yes, that's really true. But for me, they are so small, they are taking a glass of water in the night or just speak when I before wouldn't dare to do so. So these small actions are very good to experience. But still, I have a little bit of the feeling, oh, I wish I could have these big actions. <laughs> so there is still a little bit of fear that, I, that that's not for me. Yeah. Can, you, can you hear a question or something you like to say <laughs> about this? I, I will speak to that. I, yeah. I think it's absolutely beautiful and you're totally on the right track. And and the worry about the big the big things, don't worry about that. You 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 just keep doing what you're doing is is absolutely you, you it's so beautiful that you are rounding off the session with the exact the exact right thing because that is is the example of the passive and so on that's the thing that i'm looking to you know remove and help people with because i see that a lot and and then you the fact that now you say oh yeah i'll go get a glass of water or go and walk around the living room that's exactly right that's 100% that's how it works the big things follow. So that leads to that, which leads to that, which leads to that. Because you're tuning in and you're listening and you're responding, you you continue to, we're getting it all the time anyway, but you continue to hear it more because yeah. you're, you're responding to it. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, the responding. Yeah. It makes more of it. Yeah, I can feel it. Yeah. That's yeah. So, yeah. yeah. And when you um, 
gave the example of oh oh I should wait for it to pass that's in a way that's the thing that I'm fighting because there's 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 leaning into it but sometimes if the waiting is a should then that's that's not what's needed right now what's needed right now is oh yeah go get a glass of water or go and walk around the living room or whatever and that you leaning into that and you responding to that will help you hear it more and more and if you don't do it sometimes that's okay too because we just learn from that but responding to you you'll just get to hear it more so you're absolutely spot on it's a brilliant example thank you thank you and katarina thank you nina yes katarina uh you, you will be our last hello thank you for the talk tonight it's been really inspiring um when you were talking about the prison, this thought came into my head um, about manipulative behavior. And as I thought it, you started talking about manipulative behavior. But I know I have a lot of stories in my head about experiencing manipulative behavior. I'm not sure what my question is. But I don't know if you could speak to that. Yeah. Yeah. I'll give it a go. And then if I'm if I'm off track, then you can tell me. So what occurred to me was that if, even if this is hard to hear, People only ever act from love. Now, it can be completely misguided and off points, but the, um, oh gosh, sorry about that. Sorry about that. It can be completely misguided and off point, but the source is love. Now, I learned this from, from one of the guys in prison um, and he he talked about when somebody has manipulative behaviour or, or violent behaviour or whatever it is, they act from, from a deep down source of wanting to be loved in some way. It's not to say that their behaviour is right and that need, doesn't need addressing and that you have to live with it. It's just saying it's useful to see where the source is. Because when we see where the source is, our response can be different. So the guys in prison are 100%, they are manipulative, right? They're in prison, they're locked up. And if they can get cake or coffee or you to post a letter, they're going to do it. So some of it is very innocent, you know, like they stole so much coffee from me and sugar. <laughs> They eat, you know, bags of sugar. I don't even know how they're all still alive. Um, because because it's there. And they want they want it. And they don't, they're not trying to hurt me. They're not trying to harm me, but their their habits and their behavior is coming out at wanting to look after themselves. So uh, one day I said, guys, do you know that? I buy this tea and coffee. The prison doesn't supply it. And, you know, all of these volunteers that are here don't get paid. We we bring in tea and coffee. Not one person stole from me after that. Because once they realised the impact of their behaviour, they, they didn't want to do it. They, they woke up to what they were doing. Now, when someone's when someone's acting in a way that they want to get something, they want to get it because they've got a disordered thinking about what love is. And it doesn't, it's not saying it's right. It's just saying that if we see that that's what's happening underneath that, 
we can be more gentle with ourselves and not take it so personally. We can see that, oh, wow, they've got stuff going on there and that's nothing to do with me. And then that enables us to act out of love and wisdom and not fear. And and love and wisdom might say you shouldn't be around that person and that's okay. It might say something else, <laughs> lots of other things. But but we all know because we're not coming from fear, we're coming from love and wisdom. I stayed with uh, violent partners because I was fearful of what would happen if I left. But when I realised I, I, I had my little son and I didn't want that in his life, I left anyway. And now I see that person, that violent partner, actually, he he didn't want to hurt. He he just didn't didn't have any other behavior available to him. But that didn't mean I had to stay with him. That that just meant that I can now, many years on, understand his behavior and and actually forgive myself. Does that help? Yes. I've glimpsed it and it just takes me back to those glimpses. So that yes. Thank you. And and I just want to end with nobody deserves to be hurt mentally, emotionally, physically. Nobody. So if anybody's in a situation where they're being hurt, keep yourself safe. Do what you need to do to look after yourself. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Thank you. Um, I, I just want to share again the, the quote that I shared earlier by Sydney Banks uh, that uh, could speak to what Katrina was um, you know, talking about or asking about uh, there is no one who has done any better or any worse than you you know so even if someone looks like he's manipulative or she's manipulative they are that that's the best they could do given the thinking they have or the experience they are having that looks real to them in that moment so that was a beautiful um session show whatever you want to call it uh thank you for coming along and you know and just uh, uh blessing us with your presence and wisdom and uh it's been such an amazing uh you know night thank you to to have you with us thank you and thank you for all our participants for your amazing question for or for just your presence you know and uh yeah, I'll I'll see you next month. Uh Tawheed actually will be uh hosted once a month only, not twice. Uh and this is due to um you know like uh I'm doing some other stuff that's going to take uh, a lot of time for me, so uh, I'll be doing still Tawheed but only once a month. So I'll see you next month. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>